In this video, I'm going to compare two essential laws in electromagnetism. They are Gauss's law for electric fields and Gauss's law for magnetism. So let's have a look at these two laws and see what some of the similarities and differences are. So first of all, on the left hand side, I have the differential form and the integral form of Gauss's law for electric fields. Then on the right hand side over here, I've written the differential form and the integral form of Gauss's law for magnetism. You can see E, this vector E, is actually the electric field. And this vector over here, B, that is the B field or the magnetic field. So these equations actually have a very similar form. In the differential forms, we have the divergence of this vector field, and then we have something on the right hand side. And that something is different for both of these two equations. In the integral form, we have a surface integral over a closed boundary surface S, and that's, that's present over here as well. And on the right hand side, we have something, and then there's zero on this side. So you can see in both of these equations, both the divergence and the surface integral are zero. But on the left hand side, they depend on something. They're not always zero, they actually depend on rho, which is the charge density. So this is a very important quantity that tells you how much charge there is per unit volume. So what does the left hand side tell us? It tells us that electric fields are produced by charges. And the right hand side tells us that magnetic fields don't have that same property. There are no magnetic charges because there are no magnetic monopoles as far as we know. So this equation is valid experimentally for all of modern physics so far. It may be, uh, it may be needed, to, uh, there may be some requirements for future modifications to this, but for all of classical electromagnetism, this is essentially a very accurate description of the universe. So let's, let's go ahead and uh, draw some diagrams to gain an intuition uh, into these two equations. So first, on the left-hand side, let's draw a tiny little surface. We'll, we'll draw a tiny surface, and that surface is going to be S, and the volume inside is going to be V. So this V is the domain over which we're integrating the charge density. And this S, that's the boundary surface. So you can think of it as a bubble. It's a little bubble. And there's stuff passing through the membrane of the bubble. And there's stuff going outside. What is that stuff? Well, that stuff is the electric field, which is a vector field that has a magnitude and direction at every single point in 3D space. So what could possibly cause uh, electric fields to pass through this bubble? Well, the only way to have electric fields going through this surface is if you have charge density within the surface. So if there's some kind of charge inside, and it doesn't have to be a discrete distribution, it could be some kind of continuous distribution, there's going to be electric fields coming out through the surface. So that's what we call flux. So if it's positive charges, then there's going to be flux coming out. And if there's negative charges, then these guys are going to point inwards. And if there's just as much positive charge as there, are, as there is negative charge, then what you're actually going to get is no net flux. So then what's going to happen is you're going to collapse down to an equation of this form. So if there's an equal amount of positive and negative charges, then they actually cancel each other out and you have a neutral charge, which means there's no flux coming through there. A special case of that is when both uh, the number of positive charges and the number of negative charges is zero. Then you have no charge. So if you have no charge, then this turns to zero, and this turns to zero, and you have the exact same form that you do on this side. So what you're going to have is it, for any surface, any closed surface that encloses or forms the boundary of a volume, you're going to have uh, either there's some charge inside, which means there's flux through the surface, or you're going to have no flux because there's no charge enclosed. And if it's uh, a negative charge, then you're going to have field lines flowing in. And if it's a positive charge, you're going to have field lines flowing out. So I'll add some more little arrows to demonstrate that. And if there's nothing, if you have a surface S and a volume V, and there's nothing here, if there's no charge, then there's not going to be any flux. So to have flux through the surface, you need to have charge. Another interesting feature is that this integral over here is actually 
the charge enclosed. So I'll write that over here. It's the charge enclosed. So Q, capital Q, is the total charge, and this is the enclosed charge. So we have all of the charge that's enclosed within here. And so what you can do is you can actually assign a charge density to every point there, integrate that over the volume, and that's going to give you the total charge. So the total flux, which is given by this surface integral, the total flux through that surface S is proportional to the charge enclosed. Now, of course, there is a constant over here, epsilon naught or epsilon sub zero. That's the permittivity of free space. Now, let's have a look at this right-hand side. What is this right-hand side actually saying? Over here, we have the divergence of the magnetic field. And the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. This is exactly what we'd expect if there wasn't any charge density. So if rho was zero, then the divergence of the electric field would also be zero. So that means that there are no magnetic charges. So that's what this guy is saying. This guy is saying, let's draw an equivalent uh, little diagram. This guy is saying that if we were to take any magnetic field distribution, so let's say we have some kind of, uh, some kind of magnetic fields circulating around like this. So this is the magnetic field, and then we have some kind of circulation like that. So this could be due to either some changing electric fields, or maybe there's currents flowing through. You have some kind of circulating electric fields. They never start and terminate. So if you have charges, charges have places where, they, where electric field lines begin or where they end. So you can have electric field lines beginning and ending at places. Right? You can have electric field lines terminating in certain places. And in these, these sorts of diagrams, the number of electric field lines in a, in a given area that you've drawn, or a given volume that you've drawn, that actually tells you how strong the electric field is. So this would be a positive charge because uh, the field lines are going out, and this would be a negative charge because the field lines are going in. So that's one way of analyzing the electric field situation. That would be using the differential form. You could talk about the divergence at every single point. But Using this integral form, you could talk about a surface, a Gaussian surface that encloses these charges. And over here, the flux would be a net positive flux. Over here, be a net negative flux. And if you have something that where all the all the charges cancel each other out, then there'd be no net flux coming out the the surface that encloses that entire system. But let's go back to this magnetic field example. If you have magnetic fields, they never begin and they never terminate. They can either loop around. They can form loops, or they can extend out to infinity. So you can have uh, electric fields and magnetic fields extending out to infinity, but magnetic fields cannot begin and they cannot end. Or these field lines, they cannot begin and they cannot end. So if we took, let's, ima let's, let's imagine we, we take an imaginary surface here, take any surface across this location. We could take pretty much any possible surface, and we count all the points where it goes in, one, two, three, one, two, three. Equal uh, number of points going in, equal number of points going out. Over here, we have, so this arrow is going this way, so I'll, I'll specify that as well. We have the arrow is going around this way, and that's true for this case as well. So this point, it enters, and this point, it leaves. So this is the same field line, and this, this guy enters here and leaves over here. This guy enters here and leaves over here. So for every possible surface that we could draw, even if we drew some kind of surface that doesn't uh, contain any fields, there's no fields coming in and there's no fields coming out. So uh, if at any point you saw some kind of uniform magnetic field, you would have all of the magnetic field lines coming in and coming out. So overall, the net flux, or the surface integral over the entire surface, always has to be zero. It can be positive on one side and equally negative on the other side, so that everything has to cancel out to give zero. So try and draw uh, any magnetic field distribution that you can come up with. Try and draw an electric field distribution you can come up with. And I want you to verify, for any example that you can think of, that this works and that this also works. For any uh, classical electromagnetism example, the electric field lines and the magnetic field lines they are always going to satisfy these two laws. That is fundamental to the nature of classical electrodynamics. So a takeaway message from this video is, 
Gauss's law for electric fields and Gauss's law for magnetism share many similarities. The only main difference is that magnetic fields don't have a sort of charge. They don't have a monopole in the same way that electric fields do. So charge exists for electric fields and it acts as the source for electric fields. But magnetic fields, they can't be produced by some kind of charge. To produce magnetic fields, you need currents or changing electric fields.